Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special conference on global talent management. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and also director of the Center for International Business and Education, often called the CYB or CYBER using the acronym. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. LMU is one of 15 universities in the country that received this prestigious award. LMU Cyber serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the U.S. businesses community with international edu uh, the education, foreign language training and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the US companies and industries, LMU Saib has been offering special lecture series on various topics of international business that deserve our immediate attention. Today, we have invited leading scholars and experienced practitioners together to discuss one of the most important and timely topics that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to our attention, that is global talent management. We all know it is the people who are most affected by this pandemic. Disruption and uncertainty have strained employees physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially. The COVID-19 crisis has generated a renewed focus on human capital and employees. Remote work has opened up a global talent pool and new opportunities for many people. Workplace has become online and global because best talent can be found anywhere. It presents a great opportunity for companies to expand and diversify its talent pool. I'm sure our panelists will discuss these issues in detail. Before I start the program, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration, to say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Young Sun, uh, Professor Peck. On behalf of the College of Business Administration, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody today or tonight. Um, as uh, Professor Peck said, this is sponsored by our Center for International Business Education, and we're so thrilled to have uh, our distinguished guest with us today. As many of you know, we have a unique mission here in the College of Business Administration, and tonight's topic and the discussion that you'll hear from the panelists really speaks to those issues inherent in that business mission. We advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. This is such a timely occasion to be talking about global talent management. As our mission speaks to business as a force for good, it causes us to look at triple bottom line orientation, those, those three Ps of people, planet, and profit. So building off of Professor Peck's comments, I couldn't agree more when it comes to the way we need to think about global talent. And as we look forward to getting through the pandemic and building business models for a post-pandemic recovery, what might it take to bring social capital, those human resources, people, the talent to build strong organizations on the business landscape and address those challenges we're facing in our global community. Our moderator, human resource management expert and LMU CBA's very own professor, Charlie Vance will lead the panel as moderator and introduce our speakers. So again, welcome and over to you, Professor Vance. Oh, I actually that. Oh, back <laughs> to you, Dr. Smith. Peck. I mean, that's good. We can go back from back to box. Over to you, yeah. Professor Peck. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your introduction of the CBA and welcome remarks. Now I'd like to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Charles Vance, who is going to moderate the panel discussion today. Dr. Vance is a professor of management and human resources, LMU. He has had considerable experience as a consultant in training, curriculum development, and broader human resource development applications for many corporations and nonprofit organizations in America, Asia, and Europe. He has also served as a guest lecturer at several universities around the world. 
Dr. Vance has held U.S. Fulbright teaching and research appointments in Austria and China, and he has authored numerous articles and three books, including Managing a Global Workforce, which is co-authored with me. Dr. Vance, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. All right. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, today and I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, the panelists and, and all the participants uh, that are uh, listening in and, and that uh, will be able to uh, participate in, uh, in our program today. It's a, uh, I'm really pleased that we can uh, focus on this topic of uh, enhancing the inclusion practices uh, for the talent uh, within our uh, organizations to compete more effectively in our global marketplace. Um, I'm very pleased with the, uh, the panelists we have today. The, they are kind of symbolic of progress that we have made. Much of my work, has, as I'll get into in a, in a minute, has focused on creating uh, a, a greater opportunity for women in uh, the in international uh, business especially serving as expatriates. Uh, we have two women and two men as pet panelists uh, uh, with us today. But despite this progress, we can definitely move ahead and improve and uh, in, in our inclusion of talent to greater ethnic and racial representation. So uh, we can celebrate where we are today and also uh, make goals to enhance uh, the participation and utilization of our talent. As, and this is, again, reflected uh, in who we are uh, presenting today. Uh, with that point, I would like to also uh, showcase a, our Center for International Business Education, or CYBE, um, has recently uh, posted on our, our website, and you can go there uh, or look on YouTube, uh, at at our Global Business Insights video series. And uh, there I have an interview with uh, Amy Gratt, who is the CEO of EXP, the Opportunity Engine. She works with uh, the underserved, uh, underprivileged uh, uh, communities in, uh, in Los Angeles and especially uh, high schools and partners with uh, many uh, employers especially employers that are in, involved in inter international trade and international business to uh, make opportunities for these people to, uh, uh, to find and build careers in the uh, international marketplace and in our global marketplace. So uh, uh, this uh, interview is very interesting that looks at some very important initiatives that we in, in CYBE definitely want to support and, and are showcasing this in our, our, our interview series. Um, so this is uh, uh, one, again, another illustration of how we are committed to increasing the, the representation of, of uh, those uh, communities and populations that heretofore have not been uh, adequately utilized in our, uh, in our talent pools, in our international business. Uh, my research, uh, as I mentioned before, has focused more uh, specifically on women and their uh, opportunities uh, as expatriates. Having a, an expatriate uh, assignment is extremely valuable for the individual, and uh, it's a great opportunity, probably the best way as from what we can find to develop a, a global mindset, and global competencies that are important for individuals' careers anywhere in, uh, in the world. Uh, but from my research, uh, there's very strong evidence that, that there's a, a, a bias, a persistent bias for, uh, against women being selected as expatriates. Uh, in fact, in our research, we have found that this bias, we, we uh, basically ask uh, individuals, uh, can uh, women be as successful and effective as men in international uh, assignments, in expatriate assignments? 
are entering freshmen don't seem to reflect that bias. But as they, and, and this is not just at LMU, but uh, we've uh, tested other populations, uh, by the time they're seniors and even more as MBAs, males seem to have a greater bias against women as serving as expatriates. In fact, our research extended even into the global uh, uh, arena. We are asking uh, American women in, in Europe uh, about their success, as well as American men as expatriates in Europe. The men were less favorable toward the women. The women, can you be successful as an expatriate? And they're kind of looking at me like, uh, I already am, I'm doing it. I'm, I am successful. In, uh, so from this research, it's very clear that the biggest obstacle that many women uh, face uh, in their opportunity for developing global competence and gaining these international developmental experiences are not as much in the, uh, in the international uh, arena. It's actually back home at corporate headquarters and less likely opportunities of being selected for international assignments. And this often isn't... Uh, uh, this is almost a, a kindly decision that some uh, managers express. We sometimes uh, in the literature, we call this the daughter syndrome. Like I, I couldn't send my daughter abroad in that uh, male dominated uh, uh, country. And how could we do that to, the, to, to these women? Um, but they're uh, a persistent bias. But what was very clear in our research among the women who are successful expatriates, they, in many cases, have advantages and clear advantages in their, uh, in their international uh, opportunities. In fact, a very interesting trend that we have found, uh, there's a growing group of expatriates, or at least research on this group, we call self-initiated expatriates, or SIE, uh, the self-initiated expatriates, that women tend to predominate there, it seems. Me, uh, very possibly because there's a realization they don't want to wait for the corporate corporation that seems biased to send them abroad. They'll go abroad on their own and make their own opportunities. And this is some of the research that I've looked at. Just amazing looking at very successful women in their international careers, uh, as uh, self-initiated expatriates, even uh, to the extent that I now tell my students and especially my male students, you need to follow this example. Don't wait for your corporation to send you abroad. Uh, that may take 10 or 15 years or more. You, you need those uh, skills and opportunities now. Uh, so what this research has pointed out as women as uh, who predominate and more likely to be self-initiated expatriates are demonstrating an important career trend that all can follow for bettering and, and developing earlier uh, international competencies. But the, this research of mine has aimed at uh, trying to, to raise this awareness of this unfounded bias that women can be very successful in their international assignments. And as I said, in some cases, uh, they can actually have greater advantages uh, as successful expatriates. That has been some area of my research. Uh, we have uh, uh, related to the, the imperative of, of uh, uh, increasing inclusion. Now, when I emphasize this and this imperative, it certainly has, is, has a moral and ethical uh, imperative. In fact, our whole focus could be on that. We, uh, it is not today. Uh, it would be great to have uh, some other webinars looking at the, the moral and ethical reasons and justifications for increasing our inclusiveness uh, to better use our talent uh, sources. Uh, but I'd like to focus, and we'd like to focus today on the, uh, uh, the competitive imperative, because uh, as uh, Young Sun uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we need to take greater advantage of the talent pool available to us. 
and not just the talent pool abroad, but the talent pool among us. Uh, we cannot uh, justify in terms of being competitive, uh, restricting ourselves to certain types of bodies, human bodies or human characteristics. Uh, talent comes in all forms and we need to uh, not restrict our talent pool. Those who restrict their talent pools are going to lose in the competitive global arena. Uh, with that emphasis on the uh, competitive imperative, I'd like now to, to introduce our, our panelists. Um, uh, we uh, are, are very pleased to have uh, uh, different, uh, both uh, academics and, uh, and those who are uh, very much experienced in the application uh, and business practices. Uh, our first uh, presenter will be Vlad Vyman. Uh, uh, Dr. Vyman is uh, Associate Dean and Professor at the School of Management at California Lutheran University. And he's been a, a visiting professor uh, in many uh, premier universities around the world. He's published uh, five well-cited books on, on managing talent in organizations. Uh, he's uh, uh, also has many articles and book chapters in the field of, of talent management and international human resources. He's uh, been a very active consultant. He's also the founder of the European Journal of International Management and is the editorial board member of several prestigious academic journals. Uh, uh, following Vlad's presentation, we will have a discussion and reaction to his points uh, by uh, uh, Sherry Winter and Bob Bushnell. Sherry is uh, the senior director of client services uh, and, and, uh, and senior director and client services leader at GP Strategies. It's a global human resource consulting firm. So she is very much involved in the trenches of the much of this research and uh, that uh, we are involved in. She has significant experience in learning and media uh, and her focus is on uh, helping clients develop large global workforce transformation solutions to achieve their business goals. And her clients come from uh, the Fortune 100, uh, 500, Amgen, uh, Pepsi, Facebook. Uh, th these are very uh, large active corporations in the global marketplace. Uh, she uh, holds a bachelor's at uh, Colorado Christian University, served on the board uh, of the Association for Talent Development, the Los Angeles chapter. Uh, uh, she has a, a member and active volunteer of engagement for the Healthcare Business Women's Association, the San Diego chapter. She's presented and been involved at many uh, conferences and is bringing uh, with her uh, a very rich background to share with us. And finally, Bob Bushnell, He's a strategy and business development executive at Raytheon, Raytheon Company. He's uh, over uh, 30 years of domestic and international business experience in aerospace, defense, te uh, and telecommunications. He leads business strategy and development within uh, the, sec the secure uh, sensor solutions business, um, uh, Raytheon Intelligence and Space, um, he's responsible for uh, setting the strategic direction for the business and driving growth and achieving its new business objectives. Uh, and certainly he uh, knows how uh, the talent factor is critical for, to make these things happen. Uh, he, he has a bachelor's uh, uh, at Pepperdine University and an MBA at California Lutheran University. So I'm so pleased to have uh, uh, you folks with us uh, today. I'd now like to um, go ahead with, uh, with Vlad and if we can get your picture up there. And here's Vlad Vyman, uh, who now is going to uh, share with us some information after which 
uh, Sherry and Bob will uh, provide some uh, reactions. And then Elaine, I guess. Elaine, after you, yes. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me, Charlie, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Uh, and uh, let me, <laughs> excuse me, let me just uh, start sharing my screen because I want to show you a few slides uh, during my 10 minute uh, presentation. And uh, while Charlie started with um, uh, a conversation uh, about expatriates, I'm going to um, kind of enter the same topic, but from the talent management. Uh, perspective. So sharing my screen. One second. Here we are. Um, so sometimes or more than sometimes actually, I get uh, to be asked this question. So talent management, what is this all about? Is this uh, really for everybody in the company or a select few? Actually, Charlie Vance and I uh, starting uh, 2005, we've been having this, those conversations in our first book on talent management, which actually uh, turned out to be, I think, the first book on talent management and knowledge management together um, in 2008. Uh, it would look at talent as everyone in the company. But the more I was uh, getting involved in, in the topic of talent management, the more I realized that it's not as easy as it seems at first sight. So. Uh, and this is the question I get to, uh, you know, I get every, every time. Uh, talent management, is it for everybody in the company or only for select few? Let me just share um, some of the research that uh, my colleagues and I have done in this regard. And uh, then we can, you know, discuss this, of course, uh, all together. So basically, uh, in talent management literature, if you take a look at it, you will see that there are two kind of uh, definitions uh, of the same dichotomy. Uh, there's an inclusive talent management when all employees are considered talent and all can be subject to developmental activities, obviously on a voluntary basis, because you don't want to develop those who don't want to be developed themselves, because it's just a waste of time and money, um, and exclusive. Uh, talent management it refers to efforts that's aimed only at key employees and key positions. And that's how we define talent, right? Um, people in key jobs uh, or in key positions uh, and uh, those who pursue or already have unsubstitutable or hardly substitutable knowledge and skills, or, uh, you know, th this is around the definition of talent management. So again, exclusive or inclusive. Inclusive or exclusive, which one is better? Well, actually there is no answer to this question. And that's what I always tell people because first of all, you need to understand what it means to be inclusive and what it means to be exclusive. And there is no uh, positive or negative uh, connotation to either of those uh, notions. Look, inclusive talent management aimed at key employees, as we said, in key positions, that those who we call top talent. Um, what is probably more interesting here and what probably invoked a lot of debate um, on, on the part of academics is that talent management actually if in when it's exclusive aimed only at top talent really differentiates, ta differentiates talent management from human resource management because HRM applies to everybody in the company HR I should say right uh, pensions benefits salaries uh, compliance uh, and many other things uh, applies to everybody in the company, not only to top talent. So that's HR. Talent management though, uh, proponents of exclusive talent management argue is only for those uh, people who are designated as top talent. Uh, also, uh, this type of talent management supports workforce differentiation and disproportional investment um, into those people, into those skills, I should say, probably uh, that belong to only top talent as designated by the company. And of course, organizations that pursue exclusive talent management dedicate resources to the most valuable uh, employees uh, in order to ensure competitive advantage. So this is what we call exclusive um, talent management. Inclusive talent management, on the other hand, aimed at all employees. 
Then the question is, how is it different from HR HRM? Well, it could be different, but it's much more difficult to distinguish in that sense. Just bear with me for a second. I'll, I'll explain what I mean. So uh, the assumption here is that everyone has some sort of potential to create added value for the company. Everybody has, a has some sort of talent, right? Then, of course, there's consideration of increased diversity and heterogeneity of uh, your talent pools. And, of course, then inclusive talent management requires an organization to understand the meaning of talent slightly differently than it's understood under exclusive, uh, under exclusive talent management. So, again, this is just a different philosophy, different approach to talent management. And of course, saying or answering, trying to answer the question, which one is better for us, um, does not make much sense until you dig deeper. And I will dig deeper a little bit. Uh, look, there are many considerations uh, when it comes to uh, this divide, inclusive versus inclusive, uh, exclusive versus inclusive, uh, in including cultural uh, consideration, because in some cultures, um, it's not appropriate really to distinguish uh, one type of employees or one uh, kind of people, uh, you know, from, from, from the, the whole bunch. Ethical considerations that no one should be left behind, financial consideration and others. Despite that, uh, those facts, the most commonly used approach, the most commonly used around the world is so-called exclusive approach. Why? And, you know, um, business leaders do, wanna, do, do not want to talk about it because it's, again, it's maybe not egalitarian and maybe it's not politically correct, but no organization has unlimited resources. There's always, a scar there's always scarcity of resources and it's really difficult to embrace all employees. Even though we would like to talk about inclusive as something that we, we want, we do want that, of course, but um, it's difficult. It's difficult to have that in the organization that has uh, limited resources. However, I think one way to resolve this issue, one way to resolve this problem is not to look at exclusive, exclusive inclusive um, divide as a dichotomy. I propose to look at it as a continuum. Imagine it's a continuum. It doesn't have to be either one end, A, or the other end, B. It doesn't have to be either extreme exclusive or extreme inclusive. Companies can place themselves somewhere in between A and B, right? Of course, there is an exclu exclusive extreme and inclusive extreme, but you don't need to be there as an organization. Look, um, if you go with exclusive extreme, basically you uh, are for disproportionate investment in, to the, uh, in, in uh, the top talent, right? And you, most of it, you use, most of all, you use the buy approach when you focus the most on talent attraction and acquisition. On the other side of this continuum in inclusive extreme, uh, you try to allocate your resources equally, right? Uh, and you try to even out the performance among people. So this is more of a, unlike the buy approach, this is more of a grow approach with a greater focus on talent development and retention. And again, when we talk about continuum and talk about extremes, you don't need to be there. And most companies actually are not there either. You can be at any point, as I said, here uh, on this slide, you can see some companies moving some, some place in between using a hybrid uh, approach. You can focus both on attraction and development and retention, right? You can also have multiple talent pools, maybe one more exclusive for top leaders and maybe another one less exclusive or more, more inclusive for everybody else. If you have deep pockets, why not? And some companies do that. And perhaps our panelists, uh, our practitioners would be able to uh, attest to that as well. You can also use inclusive talent management practices to create exclusive talent management programs. And again, I know that the word, the word exclusive has some sort of a negative connotation. Don't think about it as such, please. Just think about exclusive as uh, for those 
who do actually contribute disproportionately, disproportionately well to uh, the overall success of your organization, okay? Uh, you can also, if you don't have much money, but you want to be, um, you want to create more of an exclusive pool, yes, focus on those high performance, focus on those high potentials or on those top talent, sure, but use more inclusive profiles to identify them, to include, of course, women, as we talked about it before, handicapped people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, different types of underrepresented uh, employees. Well, there are a few uh, uh, sorry, inclusive talent management practices that can be used to either uh, create an inclusive or exclusive pool or both. As I said before, if you have deep pockets, you can have multiple uh, pools. Um, for example, under recruitment staffing and succession planning, you can uh, or you should probably acknowledge uh, unconscious biases that your organization might have. Uh, use inclusive selection processes, uh, allow self-nomination, uh, boundary of talent pool is permeable, which means that people go in and out because no performance stays the same. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain high level of performance throughout the years, etc. cetera. Uh, in training and development, the same thing, in retention management, in, uh, you know, in definition of talent. So what does your choice depend on? If you are thinking about creating a, a talent management program in your organization, what should it depend on? Well, first of all, of course, everything should depend on, on your strategy or your organizational intent, which includes strategy, structure, values, mission, vision, et cetera, organizational culture. Also depends on organizational size and on national culture. Um, you know, I've noticed that large American companies, US firms use exclusive, more exclusive talent management. In Europe, medium-sized German firms use inclusive. In Spain, they use both. Uh, also, it depends on other factors uh, coming from macro environment, government policies, pandemic, okay? Who knew? Um, the question is, can you allow for a few, for several different talent management systems or uh, talent pools and uh, related talent management systems within your company? That's the question you need to ask yourself. But before you do that, the first step for you is to define talent and what it means for your organization because talent in um, a, because talent as i said before or might have said before is a highly contextual no notion and talent in a setting in setting a may not be the same in setting b whether this setting is a different department different assignment different organization etc 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 so i look forward to our discussions and let me stop sharing and thank you very much for your help and attention. Oh, let's see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Vlad. Um, I'd like now to ask uh, Sherry and Bob to react to some of the ideas that were presented. Uh, uh, and uh, then we'll open it up to the participants what, for what other questions they have for, for Vlad's uh, remarks. So Sherry, let's go ahead with anything from you. Yeah, I'm curious, Vlad, I uh, started uh, working with some of the major corporations on inclusive talent management over 10 years ago. It was, it was just beginning to be a concept where corporations were realizing they could increase their competitiveness by having a more diverse work teams, more diverse talent. How have you seen that change since that time 10 years ago? when these concepts started to today? Have you seen a progression? I certainly have. And, um, you know, it, it, I think there was a lot of progress since, uh, you know, if you take a look even 10, even eight and five years ago, uh, there's more acknowledgement of um, inclusivity in organizations uh, that relates to diversity uh, among uh, our workforce, different talent for different things, um, because again, Definition of talent is at the center of everything. Who do you, and what do you define as talent? And who do you define as talented people? And uh, depending on your definition, that depends actually in turn on your strategy, right? You can then create different talent pools, more exclusive, inclusive and more exclusive. I also do see both in Europe and here, uh, trend towards more inclusive talent management. But again, sometimes it's just um, more of a conversation piece 
than, than the reality. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's very nice for uh, company executives to talk about inclusivity and how inclusive they are and uh, how, my, how many uh, minorities they hire and, and things like that. Well, while in reality, they understand that it's very difficult to, um, to invest proportionally, right? Uh, and include everybody who wants to be developed. It's very, very difficult. So sort of more talk the talk than walk the walk, you're saying? For now, yes. For now, yes. Unfortunately. But that's my opinion and what I see. But the progress has been made, Shelley. Absolutely. 100%. And Bob, any reaction? Yeah. You know, looking at it from the perspective of a company like Raytheon, if you recall, recently Raytheon merged with United Technologies. Uh, to become the second largest aerospace company in the world. And we have close to 200,000 employees in the company. Uh, just the part of the company that I'm with, Raytheon Intelligence and Space, and just our business alone, we have uh, close to 40,000 employees. Uh, we operate out of uh, more than 500 different facilities in the United States. We have operations in over 40 countries. So it's it's a huge challenge for us to get the, the mix right in terms of talent management. And as you said, uh, Dr. Vyman, um, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution. You know, it's, it, we, we utilize more often than not a hybrid solution. And, and we start with um, what does that organization do, right? What is its mission, right? And if it's a, um, uh, one of our overseas operations, you know, it, it could be just a marketing office, right? It, 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 in that case, we're probably going to, uh, to, to lean more towards uh, an exclusive uh, talent management selection process where we're looking for door openers to hire. We're looking for perhaps retired senior government officials um, who could come into the company and help open new doors for us in that market. Um, if it's a manufacturing facility with a large uh, industrial base, a large population, that might uh, require a more inclusive or, or yet again a hybrid solution where we're looking for a large number of people, um, you know, to do very specific, typically technical tasks. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking to tap into, you know, uh, groups of, of, of highly trained technical people, um, that introduces a whole other set of issues. You know, we talked about biases, you know, towards, towards men, biases against women. Well, in, in, if you're looking to hire people from the STEM world, um, you're going to find typically more men than women uh, in, that, in that work pool. Um, so we hire more technical men than women just because there are more of them out there in the workplace. Now, we have a lot of programs at Raytheon to encourage women to, to move into STEM fields. And we, we invest very heavily in, in community programs that promote STEM uh, programs for women because we, we, we are completely bought into the idea that a diverse uh, workforce is a better workforce. You know, the more inclusion, the more diversity we have, uh, I think the better um, overall talent pool we're gonna create. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And that also confirms what I said before in terms of strategy and in terms of your mission and critical skills necessary. The problem, and I, I, I really like very much that you um, uh, acknowledge that it's not, uh, first of all, uh, one size fits all, A, and B, it's not an easy endeavor. It's difficult. It's especially in, 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 in the large business such as Raytheon and with, with uh, you know, multiple group of companies uh, inside of it, it's really, really um, a challenge, challenging endeavor. And uh, complexity of it is, is, is key here. And absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I think one of the other challenges is uh, in the uh, situation where you have to make an investment. So the inclusive approach requires a great deal of investment on the employer's part, right? Uh, um, through development, training, um, it, it requires a lot more. And so uh, companies need to make conscious decisions 
about the type of investment to reap the benefits, which we already know uh, there's great benefits to a more diverse workforce, but the investment has to be there in the beginning in order to get to that point. Absolutely. And, you know, it's not, there's nothing wrong in creating exclusive talent pools, but what you can do in order to uh, be more inclusive, um, you need to open your doors as, as wide as possible and invite people um, who, to apply those who you have uh, never even thought of inviting before, right? The groups of people, the, the underrepresented um, uh, minorities or handicapped or, or you know, we call them uh, physically and mentally challenged, whatever you want to call it, depending on your organization, right? And you can uh, open your doors as, as wide as possible, as long as it's transparent and well communicated. But then again, it's, it's nice to talk about it. It's, it's really difficult to see this done in practice well. I'm not sure, Sherry, are, do you agree with me that in practice, it, it's not very often that you can back, see- Back to my comment about talk the talk, but uh -huh. maybe not walk the walk, right? It's, uh, it's very challenging to move from talking about it to actually making that action happen. It takes championship, sponsorship within the yeah. HR organizations to really move that forward. Uh, and, and, and a portion of corporate, uh, you know, profits to invest in that, you know, to take that back and realize that they're gonna get a payoff on that in the end. Uh, we've, we've seen that that works. Now we just need people to put it into action. Yeah, let, let me uh, jump in uh, and ideas and things that come, uh, there will be a time later to, to circle back around, but I'd like to, address if there are any uh, participant uh, uh, questions or something for Vlad or, or the other panelists uh, uh, comments that they've made. And how do we access these? Um, There's a couple in the chat there in the Q and A it looks like. Let's see, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, Thomas uh, Bielek uh, asks, are there particular jobs and industries that fit inclusive talent better than others? It's a good question. I, I'm not sure that there are specific jobs or even industries exist that would be uh, more prone to inclusive uh, talent management because it really uh, depends on organizational intent and uh, strategy and what companies can do in order to uh, develop and or buy their talent. So I, I would say that there, I, I wouldn't be able to identify those. I don't know if uh, anybody else can identify. I, I, I would say at least for us, um, we tend to use a more inclusive approach when we're trying to recruit large numbers of people. Um, if for example, it's a manufacturing facility and there are hundreds of people there, then typically a, an inclusive, more egalitarian, you know, approach uh, tends to make more sense for us. But that's only on, a, on the recruiting side, right, Bob? The on the recruiting beginning. side. But when on we talk about development, side. when we talk about, you know, talent, talent management per se, um, right. I, I, it's, it's tough, right, to identify uh, spe specific professions. That's what I'm uh, mm. trying to say, yeah. Okay, we have a, another, another uh, uh, question. Uh, it's looking at the ethical and moral kind of implications of this cost and benefit kind of discussion of, a, of an exclusive talent pool. Uh, and, and perhaps we need to come up with a different term than exclusive because that is not- no, people that, don't like it. Right, <laughs> but, but what is, uh, Vlad has mentioned that that an exclusive approach can be very much focused at uh, the underprivileged and the traditionally those that have been left out, but they can be very much part of a, an exclusive effort in talent, uh, talent management. Yes. So, yeah, I guess that's the answer. <laughs> that's okay. the answer, yes. Yeah, okay. And what would be the parameters, this is Miguel Olivas, uh, the parameters, um, or indicators that a company uh, or an industry is being more effective uh, or especially more inclusive? What would be the indicators that they're more uh, in, their, in their talent management endeavors? Is it maybe just the representation of various groups among their talent pool? Is that 
Are those the best indicators? Um, I, I think Bob wanted to respond. I, to I think there are a number of metrics you could use. Um, one is, you know, how is your business doing? Is it doing well? Uh, can you trace any of that improved uh, performance of your business to that, you know, to the fact that you have a diverse workforce? Um, uh, retention is, is, is another one. Um, you know, if, if your employees are happy in their work, you know, that's a good indicator that uh, diversity is working. Um, I think there are a number of different metrics you can use to measure that. Yeah, I, I really like this uh, next question. Uh, again, we need to come up with a different word than exclusive, but... Uh, Miguel, you're absolutely right. Uh, you and I should get together and think about it, right? I haven't yeah. seen you in a while, but in we, our, we should do it. In the new edition of our Smart Talent Management book coming out. Okay, That's a little, right. little, little uh, advertisement. Miguel there. is on the cook then. <laughs> okay, uh, mm -hmm. but I love this, uh, this question. Do you find that an impression of an exclusive talent management strategy discourages people whose value is not as visible as typical high performers. And yeah, that's where, again, uh, it's how we communicate this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this strategy that, that we are actually very open to, uh, to any body types that are interested in coming and, and contributing to our organization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right, Charlie. Uh, there are a few issues here. One issue is that um, we need to communicate it well. We, I mean, uh, the managers, the organization needs to communicate it well and don't create, as one company told me, um, when I asked them, how do you communicate your talent decisions? They say, we use strategic ambiguity, which mm -hmm. means that they don't communicate it mm -hmm. because they don't want to upset those who haven't been chosen for talent uh, development and those who have been chosen should be quiet about that. So that's strategic ambiguity. And th this is not the way to do it, number one. And number three, I always tell managers because I, I train managers uh, to be more effective in talent uh, recognition, talent spotting, we call it, right? And development and, and reten retention, et cetera. And I always tell them that uh, get to know your employees. If you feel that they might, might of course, they, some people might be shy, might be introverted, and, and, et, et cetera. Get to know them, get to know what they want, what they like, where they see themselves in five to 10 years, in a, or even three to five years, you don't have to go 10 years. Um, because a span of management for anyone is pretty much, you know, 10, 15, 20 employees, not more than that. Even if you are in charge of uh, 40,000 uh, strong company, uh, like for example, in Bob's case, uh, it doesn't mean that if you're a CEO, you manage all 40,000 on a daily basis, right? You have your team, you have uh, your people you manage on a daily basis, get to know them. Get to know them to make sure that you understand their needs. And if, even if they shy, you uh, promote them uh, to those programs. Well, promote maybe not, may not be the right word, but at least you recommend them. So that's, that's my take. Yeah, perhaps in this discussion of ex exclusivity, it's almost a singularity, right? A singularity type of approach rather mm -hmm. than a multi-pronged approach because uh, you may target, so for, for example, the, the Fortune uh, 500 2020 report, there were only 16% uh, board seats uh, held by people of color. There were only 1% uh, of CEOs of the Fortune 500 were, were, were black males, and there were no women <laughs> as CEOs. It's, it's, a sta it's not representative of our population. And so uh, there has to be some sort of focus, I would assume, in using, you know, maybe it's not the word exclusivity, but definitely a singular approach to try to attract, develop, and, and maintain a more diverse uh, uh, talent at the top of these organizations. 100% agree. And that's why, you know, as Charlie started talking about expatriates in the beginning, and that's why only 25%, less than 25% of women among the entire expatriate population, I should say the other way around, only 25% of the entire ex uh, expatriate population are women. And uh, that's where the singular approach, I like this word singularity, more than exclusivity, but you know, we weren't able to come up with anything else before that. I'm sorry. Give you a little hint there. <laughs> Thank you. We're uh, uh, getting uh, close to uh, uh, the end of the time here, but there are a few other uh, comments. Uh, there's one I really like uh, is actually not a question. Let's see, 
me see if I can find it. Uh, basically, uh, uh, th this fellow said, it's not really a question, but his daughter just was hired by Raytheon and he's glad that it uh, looks like they are uh, open to, to all comers in terms of their, uh, their development. Um, the, uh, That's true. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, one comment uh, from uh, Francisco Valle, uh, who, uh, from a management perspective, uh, as, as well as another one looking at uh, the uh, at uh, for kind of development opportunities, but unfortunately, and Marcella Alaba mentions that often, even though we may have these development opportunities and leadership, when we get to the the uh, C sweet uh, level, as uh, Sherry was mentioning, it's often uh, that representation is not there. It reminded me of, I, I'm pretty sure it's Norway, not too long ago, passed a law that a certain number of the members of the board or, or the executive team, I can't remember, but was on a legal basis, had to have uh, women representation. Uh, is is this what it's going to take in the U.S. to increase the representation of women and minorities at leadership levels? But what's interesting is after this, Norway found that, uh, wow, we didn't realize we had such talent. Let's continue this, <laughs> this trend uh, now that we are forced into it. Uh, uh, sometimes it do does take legal measures to make these, these things happen in terms of utilization of talent. I remember many years ago, uh, we used to have the stewardess position. Then uh, the Supreme Court, I don't know if it is uh, which airline uh, was trying to, to, to claim that yes, our customers prefer the feminine touch and passing out the goodies and things on the, on the flight. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court and they said, well, sorry, uh, you don't have to be uh, a woman to, uh, to be a flight attendant. And suddenly now it's like, uh, it's it's not even an issue. It's it's, uh, and I just wonder uh, in terms of that utilization, if the legal part is going to be necessary for American companies to make that change. I, I, I hope I I hope it's not necessary. Um, I I know we're not waiting for anything like that. Um, as I said earlier, Raytheon is fully bought into the value and the benefits of diversity. And all of our employees are required to undergo diversity training. All of our business units have diversity champions. In fact, my boss is the diversity champion for Raytheon uh, Intelligence and Space. And, and, and what that means is that we have regular meetings with all of our people to, um, to, to educate them, to inform them as to the, you know, the, the benefits of uh, diversity and inclusion and, and uh, having equity in, in, in the business. Um, we encourage all of our employees to join what we call um, ERGs, employee resource groups. And these are organizations made up of people who, um, you know, have some common um, characteristics, you know, whether it's the, you know, Raytheon Asia Pacific Association or the, you know, another group that, that might enjoy a certain type of sport. Uh, whatever it is, there are a whole bunch of, of these resource groups uh, at Raytheon and they're formally sponsored by the company. And, and what, th what their primary mission is, is to create a culture of inclusion. And it's to create a network for these people to, you know, leverage each other to advance in their careers, to learn more, to gain new experiences, to land new jobs, you know, and it's it's a very, very effective thing. And again, we're not waiting for it to become a law. You know, we, you know, we we know it's important, we know the benefits, and you know, we're doing everything we can to uh, to propagate it within the company. Yeah, we have that too here at uh, GP as well, uh, Bob, uh, the employee resource groups. But I want to make one comment. We do have a law here in California with regard to publicly traded companies now have to have a female on their board. That is a law that was passed at the end of 2019. And it is, a, it, you know, it did take action by legislators to say, you know, we've got to more fairly represent the population in our 
corporations. And if they're publicly held, then they have to, you know, abide by those uh, guidelines. So, um, yeah, we've, we've already got some legislation doing that. Yeah. And I, I know that we we're supposed to finish this particular part right now. I can see that we're given signal. Just wanted to say that, uh, unfortunately, United States and Canada, for that matter, are behind Europe uh, in this matter, in, matter, in the matter of inclusivity. Uh, for example, in Iceland, uh, it's been already five, six years since they decreed that 40% uh, of every board should be uh, consisting of, of uh, female employees. 40% at least. Sure. And it's, uh, you know, it's a law right now. A little bit behind, but we'll get there, I hope. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Vlad. Uh, well, with that point of, uh, of uh, the importance of bringing on greater uh, uh, female representation, let me introduce our, our next uh, academic presenter. Uh, Elaine Farndale uh, uh, comes from uh, Pennsylvania State University. She is uh, uh, on the East Coast, and how's the weather there? <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, um, Elaine is very active in the international HR uh, uh, community in space, uh, of, uh, especially in the research, of, uh, very active in sponsoring conferences of, in um, international human resources. She's director of the Center for International Human Resource Studies, professor of human resource management, and associate director of the School of Labor and Employment Relations at uh, Pennsylvania State University. Widely published research encompasses a broad field of, of uh, strategic human resources, including international uh, human resource management. So I'd like now to turn uh, some time over to Elaine Farndale. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, hello to everybody. Nice to see everybody in this kind of virtual world, but it's, it's good to be able to speak with you all. I am just going to also share my screen if I can just press a couple of buttons here one moment with you and hopefully that is now working. Um, so I would add a very interesting conversation that, that we've been having so far, and I would like to throw a, a bit of a global perspective on this now um, and talk about global talent pools and what inclusivity or exclusivity might mean in that kind of context. The, the title that I kind of gave this is the opportunities created by the globalization pause. And there are at least two assumptions in that title that I, I want to talk to you about. So the first kind of glaring piece is the globalization pause. And we can kind of debate whether that is actually happening, whether we have a pause in globalization or, or, or what just what's going on. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But then also, um, you know, can we actually get opportunities from what's happening around us at the moment or are we just faced by challenges? It, on a day-to-day -day basis, it certainly feels like a, a multitude of challenges that uh, the pandemic is, is throwing at us. Um, but I, I, I always think the glass is half full, so I think there are some opportunities out here as well. So I'd like to talk to you uh, about a few of these things as well. So. So first of all, the globalization pause. Um, it, this is a, from an academic side, this is a term that's just started appearing. And what, what it's essentially saying is um, organizations for, well, basically for the last few decades have been focused on globalization, on, you know, how can we expand our reach? How can we get to new markets? And building strategies around that kind of global perspective. Even small organizations have a global view um, nowadays. But then in over the, not just the pandemic, but about two or three or four years prior to, to now as well, um, we've seen some breaks being put on that globalization process. Um, we can think of around 2016, 2017, when the immigrant visa situation um, in the US, um, when there was more restrictions being put in place for, for immigrant visas. And there were, there were travel bans and things starting to be put in. Um, and a number of large organizations, particularly tech companies, uh, were lobbying the government to uh, you know, stop those restrictions. 
because they couldn't get access to the talent that they needed. You know, this becomes a major talent issue for organizations. Um, we have Brexit going on, something very close to my heart as from the UK originally. Um, again, that's kind of one of these uh, situations where you're in a very um, multinational context is suddenly being say, okay, no, we want to be our own identity again. And, and closing some of the barrier, the um, borders and focusing more internally and less focus externally. And that's having a huge impact on talent in the UK and flow of talent into and out of, of the UK. Um, so overall, you know, what, what does this kind of mean for us? Is if as organizations, we've been focused on globalization and now we're having some of the kind of the facilitators of globalization taken away from us and some barriers being, being put in place. Um, so looking some, from an economic perspective as say we, we were taking a kind of, uh, th there are certainly moral and ethical pieces to this, but taking the competitive perspective that uh, we were focusing on in, in this particular section, session, um, the World Economic Forum noted that the global labour markets are undergoing major transformations and these transformations, if managed wisely, could lead to new age of good work, good jobs and improved quality of life for all. But if managed poorly, it poses risks of widening skill gaps, greater inequality and broader polarisation. And I think that is so true when we start looking at global talent pools and how organizations are able to manage their way either using global talent pools or the restriction of these global talent pools. So what am I alluding to here? Um, the first piece is that talent management does not happen in a vacuum. We don't close all the company doors, sit in a room and just you know, manage our talent. It happens in the context of the whole environment in which the organization is set. So government policies around immigration, um, the, um, the level of education in the labor market around us, um, the, all these things are affecting what we can do with our talent, various laws, regulations, agreements, um, everything to do with employment in that external environment has an impact on how we are gonna manage talent in our own organization. And therefore, because there are so many moving parts there, um, we need to have a strategic response rather than an ad hoc response. So as one piece of legislation changes, um, we, we can't kind of write, okay, we follow the route that that pushes us in and we'll forget everything else. No, we need to make sure that if something changes, what effect is that going to have overall on the way that we can manage our talent and, and what strategy that we have in place for that. So the first kind of key, key issue is that talent management doesn't happen in a vacuum. Now, on top of that, my argument is that global crises are terra economita, they are um, unknown territories and that can offer us new opportunities. So rather than seeing, oh, it's the next hurdle, oh, it's another crisis, huh, how are we going to manage this? It's okay, what opportunities are these crises um, actually creating for us? And certainly the pandemic is, is giving us a lot of new ideas around this. Um, the, what I'm speaking to you uh, about today was largely based on research that I did uh, with some colleagues. Um, when did we start it? About four years ago. Um, and we were looking particularly at the new immigration regulations and how that was affecting the flow of talent into high tech firms, so STEM talent into high tech firms. Um, and we interviewed a number of um, 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 talent management professionals and association, uh, professional association um, um, experts who were explaining to us how they were reacting to those new regulations and things being put in place um, in the US, in Australia and in the UK, because in all situations, similar things, things were happening. 
And ultimately, we were trying to work out the, what were the coping strategies that firms were putting in place as this um, situation was changing. And essentially, what we were, what we found out of this research was this need to, to balance a range of what we call inclusive talent opportunities. So now we're trying to find ways of, of, of winning in negative situations. Um, the first kind of key takeaway out of this was to shift a mindset away from the cost of talent and to build our priorities around what the current supply situation looks like. So um, looking at the type of talent that we needed, as, as Vlad was just um, saying, you know, we have to identify who is talent or what is talent in our organization and in inclusive or exclusive. But then where are we going to find that talent, particularly if we need to bring new talent into the organization, where are we going to find that talent? The instant thought is, well, you know, what's going to be the cost of this? But we can't focus too much on the cost anymore because the supply is becoming more restricted. Um, so therefore, we have to have we have to kind of shift from this cost to this supply mentality when thinking about it. A second um, takeaway out of it was there are two things we can do. One is short term, one is long term, but they both need to be happening. The first is retraining talent um, to fill some of these gaps. So looking internally, being inclusive, uh, looking inside the organization, who can we retrain to fill the, the needs that we have? Um, but at the same time, thinking about the longer term for who we want to pull into the organization, building a homegrown talent pipeline by working with uh, schools and colleges and, and you know, connecting with these people who are producing our future talent so that we have that, that um, pipeline set up. And then the, the third kind of takeaway was balancing external overseas recruitment, which has become increasingly difficult because of the immigration situation um, with the use of captive offshoring. So one is you move the people um, to your organization. Um, captive offshoring is where you move the work to another country um, in order to be able to, um, to get that, that completed. The overall takeaway um, from this was that HR then has to make decisions between these different alternatives. And ultimately what is being balanced here is social acceptability and flexibility. So we have questions around social acceptability in terms of you know, moving jobs overseas, um, offshoring work, um, and also bringing people in from other countries. The immigrant workforce has a bigger challenge inside the organization to, um, to be, to um, kind of socialize in the organization, be, be integrated. Um, and then on the flexibility side, from an HR perspective, what you're trying to do is ensure that you're able to address some of these social ac acceptability pieces in the strategy that you're putting together. So you need to be able to come up with flexible solutions um, that can address the challenges that social acceptability um, are, is offering. There's a lot more detail behind this research that I'd be happy to share with people beyond this, but I am conscious that uh, time is time is um, running very short. So I'll, I'll stop at this point and um, look forward to uh, the, the, the discussion. Okay, Elaine, if you can uh, unshare and... Uh... Yeah, I'm just trying to get to the, there we go. Uh, well, and, and let me jump in, uh, I just, can't wait to ask this this question uh, before we hear from uh, Sherry and Bob. Um, it just struck me that uh, a tighter uh, visa or you know uh, visa restrictions, were fewer uh, fewer visas granted. Has that from you from you seen uh, forced companies to be more resourceful? in working with local sources of talent, like uh, the interview I have with Amy Gratt and uh, 
and her working with high school students in, in looking for opportunities for uh, uh, career opportunities with uh, international firms. Um, has this happened from what you can see? Absolutely. Um, that is exactly what we saw. Um, and it was nice to see kind of the emphasis was on wanting to build long term relationships with educational establishments. Um, that was like number one priority to be able to um, build a future talent pipeline. Um, the only problem with that is you could be 10, 15 years out before you actually get those people into your organization. Um, so there have to be short term solutions as well. But absolutely, it focus, focuses the attention on the, the internal um, or domestic workforce and away from this notion of, well, we can get anybody we want from anywhere across the world. That certainly changed that perspective. Mm -hmm. Is Sherry or uh, Bob? Yeah, I was just going to comment that um, one thing I'm seeing among at least the corporate partners we work with is while they used to require physical presence a lot more since the pandemic, those requirements have dropped because of the pandemic and they're, they are learning and adjusting to uh, being more comfortable with remote work. Uh, which then opens up a greater ability, not even just for their internal talent, but even for service organizations like ours to be able to support them remotely uh, before they would, you know, sort of say, well, you're, you know, you're not local to us. So, you know, we're going to go with a local company. And, uh, and now we see an opening up of them being able to work with us uh, due to everybody kind of adopting a little bit better open mind to the, to the remote uh, approach to that. So I think when we're talking about global talent as well, we're even able to, you know, support our customers with some of our global offices uh, here in North America that previously we, we may not have been able to uh, due to the resistance and wanting to have, you know, that sort of more local presence. It has required, uh, one of the, the things we haven't talked about in the globalness is time zone challenges, right? So, so while you might be, you know, working with those talent pools across the globe, uh, you know, getting them to work within the time zones that work for everybody is still a little bit of a challenge on, you know, uh, that global workforce and being, trying to be inclusive of everyone uh, given their normal work hours. Um, so, you know, so that's just one of the considerations when, uh, you're thinking about uh, including more resources from across the globe. Would you say that's still a challenge you see, Elaine? Absolutely. The, the points that you raise are, are excellent. And I think, as I say, that the research that I was basing a lot of this on was just before the pandemic hit. So there is a mindset change happening. Um, and I think we've got to think about, is globalization about physical globalization or virtual globalization? Um, and I think what's going to be interesting going forward is the extent to which this, this virtual world that we all live in now is, is really sustainable. Um, it has certainly opened up some new opportunities. And I would say, I, it includes people who were previously excluded, but at the same time excludes people who were previously included. So it's it's just different. It's changed. It, it, it hasn't actually um, made it better or worse, potentially. Um, but, it, it, you know, we're in the middle of a social experiment right now. And who knows what the actual outcome is at the end of the day and, and what that's going to look like. Yeah, we, we were very nervous about, um, you know, w whether or not we could sustain the business, work all, all of us working virtually or many of us working virtually. And we've been, you know, very pleasantly surprised that we've been able to keep everything going, everything on track, um, not only just with our domestic operations, but with our international operations as well. And, and we do see that a lot of that is gonna, is gonna remain with us after the pandemic. We're already bucketing people, you know, our employees into three buckets. You know, the first bucket would be those people who 
will have to remain on site. Um, you know, perhaps those people in a manufacturing facility, touch labor, those folks will have to still come into the factories and build, you know, the products. But then there's a, another group that it's going to be um, instead of, um, you know, being in the office full time the way they were prior to the pandemic, they're going to be able to maybe spend two days a week in the office and then the rest of the time working remotely. And then there's going to be a bunch of us who will be able to work, uh, always work remotely. And uh, so right now we're trying to figure out just where we place everybody. But um, Elaine, you made some excellent points about what American companies need to do, you know, in order to, you know, address these, these changing conditions. And um, it, it particularly hit home for me being LA based. Uh, we, we have uh, about 5,000 open requisitions that we need to fill in 2021. And many, as you can imagine, many of those positions for Raytheon are, are, are highly technical positions. And, and trying to find um, that number of, of qualified people and convince them to move to Los Angeles where the cost of living is crazy, you know, and where commuting is, is, is a challenge, you know, it's really hard for us to fill those recs. Um, I mean, it's, it's been a ch challenge for us for, for years and years and years. And then now with the pandemic and, and, and the kind of proof point that we can all work remotely pretty effectively, you know, we're now trying, you know, changing our strategy for, for uh, you know, attracting and hiring people to, to, to what Sherry mentioned. You know, we're, we're now looking at, you know, people from all over the country and, and we're not so concerned that they, you know, they, they have to physically be located here in Los Angeles. So I think that's a real positive development. Yeah, certainly. I, I think it's, I really have a sense of, we, we don't know what the future looks like. We don't know what the new normal is going to be. I know that's kind of a, a, a standard phrase now, but um, certainly kind of in the world of education, yeah, we can still teach all our students remotely, um, but they've chosen for an in-person experience. There's always there's a there's a remote option out there already. They they made a choice between two clear um, options open to them, and they made a choice to come to an in-person kind of environment. Now they're being forced a lot of the time into a remote situation, and yeah, they're still being taught, and, and you know. We could say the same in any organization that you know people chose to come to the workplace um, but now they're not able to be there um, but I, I personally I'm just not convinced that uh, in the long run that's going to be the desired way that people as human beings want to interact um, we can we can sustain it for a period um, but I think I'm already noticing that I think some of the innovation is more restricted. I think the the idea sharing, um, you know, it's the corridor conversations that we're just not having anymore. And those are such important parts of, of how organizations operate. And I also say that actually that can be advantageous because some of those corridor conversations can be very um, exclusive, <laughs> you know, they're not involving everybody. And at the moment, if you're having conversations, you're actually involving more people. And those little side conversations don't happen so much. So, um, it, you know, it's opening up some opportunities. But at the same time, I think it's it's closing down um, other areas of activity. So I know no it's, as, it's an experiment. I want to see the outcome. <laughs> yeah, very true. Hey, young son, uh, I think you had a question. Would you like to raise that? Uh, are you there with us? Well, I'm not a panelist, so for a moment. <laughs> That's okay. I thought, but uh, I'm kind of prompted to, you know, jump to join you. Um, so I, I think that Elaine made her, you know, the very important point. Um, so I just kind of follow up uh, with a, a presentation. So due to pandemic, the workplace has become online and global because the best talent can be found anywhere. So in the process of talent acquisition, how seriously do you think US or even the companies in Europe or Asia 
to the best of your knowledge, actually practice this DEI principle, because we talked a lot about the exclusive versus what the inclusive, uh, the talent management, not only for domestically, but also globally to access and leverage global talent. So any of you, you know, the Elaine or Sherry or the Bob uh, from your experiences and particularly Sherry that, uh, you know, you're dealing with a lot of corporations. So I'm just curious about the, how this, uh, you've actually seen the, any kind of change in terms of the, uh, when the company actually the recruiting uh, these talent people. So we recently surveyed about 946 uh, of our sort of partner community uh, at GP Strategies across our, our, our many uh, partnerships and, and corporations that we support, uh, you know, all across the world from North America, EMEA, APAC, uh, uh, we, we had 946 people respond, um, and uh, a good portion of those, uh, 138 were executive leaders and 260 of them were senior leaders. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we discovered in that is, is, is back to that sort of, yes, we have all these policies, we have DNI in place, you know, uh, basically, you know, 51% would say we, we already had, you know, diversity and inclusion policies in place because this was part of our study on is this a moment or is this a movement um, and because we wanted to really know you know is this um, focus now on on DE and I just a moment in our history or is this really a movement that's going to actually change things right. and so 31% uh, did say that they had increased their training and education around DE and I which was a movement, uh, at the, but the leader's perspective was different than the employee's perspective. <laughs> so while well, the leader said that that you know they thirty one percent had believed that they trained you know increased their training and education, only sixteen percent of employees felt that. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a disconnect there's, between the two. Yeah. You know, some discrepancy among that, right? right. So uh, so we're learning a little bit through some of our research. Um, and what we've noticed too is that only about 12% of the leaders said that their companies had actually changed any policies recently. So that was very telling as to, you know, um, where, you know, how slow the change might be and whether or not, you know, this is just a popular topic right now or whether it's going to actually be realized in organizations. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh I would say our policies at Raytheon with regard to uh, diversity and inclusion um, are pushed out from the very highest levels in the company uh, out to all of the, uh, the operating units within the company. Um, and that's not just in the United States, but to all of our international uh, operations as well. Uh, and the extent to which um, these policies are being embraced kind of differ from, from country to country, I would say, and, and somewhat reflect um, the feelings in that country about these kinds of issues. Um, it's, we're having more success in Europe, as you can imagine, and less success in other parts of the country. Uh, but we are seeing uh, successes um, even, even in, you know, the Middle East where, um, you know, there are societal issues with, um, you know, some of our uh, views um, uh, of diversity and inclusion. Um, but despite that, we're, we're seeing um, some improvements, some advances in diversity. And, and, and some of that's being, some of that's happening because of what we're pushing out there, but it's also happening because those societies are undergoing, many of them undergoing a, a tremendous amount of change right now. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I did my first uh, expat uh, assignment when I was 19 years old. I took a break from college to go uh, work in the oil fields in Saudi Arabia to make money to come back and finish college. Wow. And, um, and uh, you know, where I was working, I would go four or six months without ever seeing a woman. I and mean, we were just out in the middle of the desert building oil refineries and stuff like that. And there were no women anywhere. Um, and then even at the headquarters at Aramco, the oil company there, you know, you saw very, very few women um, who were, you know, unless they were somebody's spouse, right? They were there as a dependent. Um, today in Saudi Arabia at the Raytheon offices in Riyadh and, and in other parts of the kingdom, we have Saudi women working in the office. 
And, you know, even two years ago, that would have been unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of uh, advancements there. Just, just this week, uh, the United Arab Emirates announced uh, a whole bunch of changes uh, that uh, now will, will um, you know, pro prohibit things as, as radical as cohabitation. You know, you know, six months ago, that would have been, you know, an offense that, you know, could land you in prison. Um, so the, the rate of change is, is really quite, uh, um, it, it, it's remarkable. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're just, we're going to see that more. And, you know, just, you know, back to the, some of the earlier points that were made today, it, it's never a one size fits all, it, you know, we've got to find the solution to manage talent, um, and, and do it in a way that, um, works, uh, in, in, in a given environment or a given market. So, so we're having to, you know, kind of tailor make our, our strategies depending on, on where we are and what the needs are of the business. Let me, let me get uh, into some questions and we can, again, always circle back around. Uh, here's one that uh, I want to get back to Elaine on, uh, that I think is really critical here. Is a homegrown, and this is from Herman uh, Lasselben, uh, there we go, I think that's, um, is the homegrown uh, talent pipeline a sufficient solution given the demographic changes. Basically, uh, is, is that enough? Uh, again, we have kind of a, a tension on go abroad for the talent or do we have enough talent here that we can develop and, and take and, and opportunities that will also be beneficial for these uh, traditionally neglected uh, populations? I, I think you've, you've partially answered the, the, the question um, there because I think that that is the, the the whole issue. As soon as we started to see this kind of um, shutting down of, of, of borders and a more focus on internal talent, what that does is it increases the competition for that domestic talent um, because the, the global firms who would normally go elsewhere are focusing inward, but then you've also got the domestic firms who were never looking globally, who are always just looking locally, also trying to draw from those same pools. What we really need to be doing is to be trying to locate where talent lies. And I think Vlad mentioned this um, a little bit earlier that we need to be able to have a more inclusive consideration of where that talent might be. So, um, kind of breaking down uh, a standard notion of how are we going to find our next engineer? We need a male or, you know, just simple things like that. Well, yeah, they could be male, they could be female. We, this could be um, um, people who were born in this country, people who have immigrated to this country. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities and pockets of people who are not having opportunities to um, advance themselves, that if we can get those people into better situations to be able to um, uh, receive a better education, for example, then they're more likely to be there for us in the pipeline for the future. Um, I think realistically, this globalization pause is going to be temporary and we are always going to have global talent pools to an extent. And, um, you know, we, we don't just, we shouldn't close our eyes and just focus internally, but we do have to start making better use of the internal um, supply that we have and, and pockets that we haven't explored fully uh, in terms of the skills and things that they can offer. Uh, it's time to be thinking about those and, and give people more opportunities. Yeah, our, I'm the moderator, but actually, uh, I have another moderator who tells me we have one minute. Uh, so I just wanted to get an, another question out. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, in, in terms of, uh, and this is to uh, Dr. Ferndale and uh, everyone, do you believe that mid-size and large companies will have to expand to lower rated sources, uh, I guess of talent, uh, their preferred list of challenges to hire uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, that we're experiencing? A, a lower uh, like a source or a uh, different source 
of, of uh, individuals uh, for hiring? I think that was a little of what I was just trying to, to say. In as much as we've got to look in different places, places where we may not have looked before. I'm, I'm not so keen on the term of lower sources, um, but more just different ways of exploring where talent lies. I, I, the thing that I have seen through this pandemic is people who may not have um, being classed as our top performers previously has some people are now way up there they are classed as top talent because this this way of communicating and working it, it just works for them and it allows them to shine um, so can we create in the future um, situations that allow different people or different types of situations that allow different types of people to shine and that allows us to get into these different pockets of talent that are out there. Absolutely. I just wanted to piggyback on what Elaine just said. Uh, recently, I have a, I had a student in my class, in, the, in my executive MBA class, who is uh, working at, uh, well, I'm not going to name the company, but it's the biggest biopharmaceutical company in the world here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, <laughs> and um, she is... Um, she has always been overlooked uh, in terms of uh, developmental opportunities and other things. But now she has become the top talent in the company. You know why? Her title is Director of uh, Workplace Safety, Health and Safety. And now she has become uh, not only uh, the, the most needed person, but also she's getting uh, offers left, uh, right and left uh, for development, for uh, promotion, for C-suite opportunities, etc., etc., etc. So the definition, that's what I'm saying. Uh, that's what I said before. That's what Elaine also said. The definition of talent itself is changing and has changed due to both deglobalization uh, trends and uh, the global pandemic. Thanks, Vlad. Um, we uh, and have several questions, but we uh, will uh, return to these. Part of our program, we've, uh, we've uh, uh, scheduled some time that uh, Sherry and Bob have some, uh, besides just reacting, critiquing comments, but uh, what particular messages that they may have for us today that I'd like now to turn the time over to, to Sherry and then, then Bob for anything particular that you wanted to bring uh, to us today. Well, from our perspective as a workforce tra transformation company, uh, we, we see the value of the investment in the talent. Uh, people are the strongest uh, resource that a company has in, in providing uh, the top level of services, products, uh, and uh, innovation. And so we would uh, be proponents of, you know, really focusing on that aspect that Vlad was talking about and Elaine too, in terms of investing in your talent, uh, making sure that you are developing that talent along the way and, and not overlooking talent in your organization or outside of your organization, not dismissing, uh, you know, individuals based on, uh, you know, kind of narrow uh, what was previously thought of uh, approaches. Uh, and then once that talent uh, is integrated into your organization, ensuring that you're supporting them in the right way, um, that's what's going to really make your, your, your talent base competitive and, uh, and, and, and looking outside of traditional uh, approaches to talent as well. Um, both in recruitment and in the eventual development of that talent. So, um, you know, it, it does take an investment on the company's part, uh, but there's a great payoff to that investment. And we've seen it in the statistics. Yeah, Sherry, I, I, I agree. And, and, and we at Raytheon try and um, implement uh, programs that, uh, that, that create an atmosphere of, of trust and respect and accountability. Um, I mentioned the uh, employee resource groups. Those are really important because, um, you know, we, we see um, 
uh, communities coming together, groups of people coming together where they have shared values. Uh, and, and we like to um, uh, give them and encourage them um, to, to <clears throat> promote themselves, to pursue their interests, to pursue their training, to pursue their education, to participate in um, you know, company uh, sponsored programs that, uh, that help them kind of learn new skills and advance in their careers. Um, the, the, the most, I think, important cultural you know, trait that we like to instill or imbue in our people is um, just a, a feeling of safety. You know, we, we want everybody, regardless of whether they're working in the United States or working at one of our overseas uh, operations, to, 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 to really believe that, you know, whatever they, they feel is important to them, they can do, and they can do it in a safe environment. They can put forward ideas in a very safe environment. And, and w one thing that we take very seriously is the respect of our employees. And, and, and when you have an environment like that, a culture like that, uh, you know, so many good things stem from that. You know, we, we have fewer retention issues because people really want to work for us. Um, you know, we, we have, um, you know, pe people come to me as a manager all the time and say, hey, Bob, you know, how can I move into your organization? You know, and they may come from a, a you know a completely different organization, uh, and a career path might not you know uh, logically take them from where they are into my organization. But they know that they can come into my office, they can open the door, they can knock on the door. They'll always be welcome, and they'll say, "Bob, you know, I love engineering, but I want to be a business development person, or I want to be an expat." Um, and and our culture prevents me from not engaging with them in a really positive, health, helpful, healthy way. And um, I, yeah, I really value that about our company. And um, I, I, I think, um, you know, the more we can, we can instill that in our organizations, the better off we're gonna be. And a lot of it basically boils down to, you know, diversity and inclusion and all the things that we've been talking about today. And we take it very, very seriously. I yeah, just want to add one more thing to that, Bob. Uh, we uh, sort of have a similar background. I didn't realize I went to Africa and worked for a year between high school and college. Yeah. Which was unheard of, you know, 30, right. almost 40 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. A long time ago. Uh, but yeah. I was fortunate in having some family that had gone and worked in Kenya and uh, for a large global organization. So uh, so I took, took advantage of that opportunity. And I, I will tell you, it's about my mind, global mindset, right? It's about having a, a much more diverse mindset. And I think over the years, uh, I have seen where that's played to, to my advantage as well. Having worked in an expatriate type of situation, uh, it, it definitely is, is very enlightening from that perspective. But I was, I was a unicorn back then, so. <laughs> right, sure, sure, absolutely. No, I, uh, I was very lucky. My father was uh, in the diplomatic service. So I was born and raised overseas. So, you know, going from the US to work in the oil fields in Saudi Arabia as a 19 year old kid, wasn't a huge deal for me. It was terribly frightening for a lot of people, but um, you know, for me, it, it wasn't a big deal. But um, like you, that experience and, you know, all of my international experiences has, has just, caused me to open my mind and, and, and just be so much more accepting of, you know, different cultures and different practices and different religions and all that. And we need to encourage that in all of our people, you know, for, for those who are U.S. based and haven't traveled a lot, you know, we need to give them those exposures and those experiences. And, and often uh, an expatriate assignment is the best way to do that. Yeah. Elaine or Vlad, any reaction or comments from uh I, I just sitting listening to these things i i would like to to challenge everybody here everyone who's listening to to start taking risks with people and and by that i mean you know having this this global mindset or this open mindset that says well okay, I, I, I need to challenge myself as to thinking um, what biases may I have when I'm selecting people, when I'm you know, lo looking at who the next um, you know, top talent is. And just to really 
challenge the way that you think about things and take a risk and and give people opportunities that you may be nervous about doing but with the with a view to to you know, finding ways to make it work so <laughs> being a little bit cryptic here but what, it, what I'm trying to, to get to is the only way that we can break out of um, the kind of the, the ways that we're locked into thinking about things is pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries is um, seeing. So let's take, for example, um, uh, an, an immigrant employee and OK, they have a. Uh, they've not been able to develop as much in the organization because uh, their English is good, but not as good as their colleagues. And therefore, they may not be able to present as well or, or something like that. And they need to do that as part of a, a particular job or something. Um, so let's take that challenge and let's take that risk with that person. Let's think about that person as actually... Uh, this person is is bilingual, possibly more languages, don't know, but, you know, they're having to balance a home language and a new language. Um, they are living in a different culture, so they're having to learn all of the, the ways of operating and everything. There's a huge amount of learning that that person is going through. So that person is, is developable, <laughs> it's really that trainable. Um, they have that ability. Okay, they have a disadvantage that they weren't born with English as their mother tongue, for example. Um, but let's and let's take a risk. Let's invest in that person and let's see where we can get them to, because they have skills that um, others of us don't have. We maybe not be bilingual or or whatever, or have not lived in another culture or something. So yeah, and I'm, I'm just trying to kind of push on our boundaries, push us out of our comfort zone. And that's the way that we then can start kind of being inclusive um, and overcoming some of the challenges we have in finding talent by creating new pockets of talent. It takes work, it takes effort, and it takes, um, it, it, it takes risk, <laughs> you know, it means we have to take risks. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable for us, but yeah, I, I think it's time for us to start thinking in these ways to, to change the way that we, we go about talent management. I have a question actually for all of the academics in the meeting here, <laughs> the professors with your expertise. What advice would you give to corporations in that, um, you know, being that you're in the academic community and developing young talent coming in, uh, you know, what what focus should uh, corporations have on uh, where that talent's coming from and how it's being developed uh, before it reaches them in the corporate world? Let me just jump in. Uh, I, what I should do is uh, put together a, a recording of my class, uh, Your Future Career in the Global Marketplace, where for my freshmen, I really try to uh, emphasize how critical it is for them to develop a gl global mindset and global competence. And the best way, and uh, several of you have mentioned, and including Bob just recently, is by having those international experiences. And as part of their internal educational process, uh, have these, uh, these companies, uh, for those employees who may have an interest, and very often people just out of the curiosity, are interested in, in some kind of an experience in Europe or something else. But just to try to create within them the wonder and the interest for possibly looking into some uh, uh, a, a career that involves some international experiences. I think as part of it is just an internal educational process to uh, for people who normally may be overlooked uh, for that for uh, creating that interest among those people. And from the company perspective, I say um, uh, the following, I would say that um, <clears throat> go from your demand, uh, you know, think what set of skills, knowledge and abilities you might need to achieve your strategy. And then 
then look at these skill sets and pursue them wherever they are, be it in different industry, in different state, in different country, and look for those knowledge, skills, and abilities that include, again, depending on your strategy, all those uh, technical or hard and soft skills that you need to, to be successful as an organization. And, um, you know, that's the way it is. Right. Let me, uh, we, we have some more questions. I'd like to go back to these to make sure that they're not uh, missed. Uh, uh, Miguel Olivas is asking about um, kind of the, the uh, an ethical perspective of HR kind of motivating us versus something, or is that equivalent to social acceptability? Maybe more of a, like what is socially uh, desired? What should be driving us in this uh, in this effort to increase our inclusivity? Uh, social accept uh, like are we is it good PR or is there a stronger, deeper ethical perspective? Yeah, I think that's. Um, I'm, I'd like to believe it's about ethics um, and, and not about PR. Um, but the social acceptability piece is. Uh, it, it, it's largely around, um, you know, to attract talent and to retain talent, you have to be a good employer. You know, so how do you become a good employer? Um, and by being socially acceptable is one mechanism. And that the social acceptability there is then thinking about um, how you're positioning what the organization is doing relative to the context it is operating in. So how does the organization react to um, whatever employment related regulations um, are being put in place? Um, the, the immigrant visa um, um, reduction, you know, that sort of thing. What, how does the organization actually react to that? Um, because one of the things that was happening along, one of the reasons for reducing um, immigrant visas in the US was a fear of losing US jobs to overseas. Um, I, I don't want to get political in this, it's just a, a, a reality of the way that it, it was. And, but there was another side to it as well. Um, and that is how immigrant workers uh, were being treated inside organizations. Um, and there is this, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of social barrier that the immigrant workers were having to deal with in organizations. So it's a them and us kind of situation. I mean, I'm a US person and you're somebody else. Um, and therefore your opportunities are not gonna be the same as uh, the US person's opportunities. Um, is that socially acceptable? Well, you know, there are, there are multiple camps on that as to who's going to find that acceptable. But from a, certainly from an HR perspective and from a talent perspective, you then, um, you need to kind of build some, some ethics around this and to be able to show that your organization is operating in, in an ethical way that's what will make your organization kind of socially acceptable and the talent management plans that you've put in place if you've got an ethical base for those that should increase the social acceptability piece that would be my take on it yeah there's another question uh this probably elaine again for you but others who may uh, know this uh this is from thomas bielek uh you see a large influx of international applicants since the pandemic, I would almost think it'd be the opposite. Uh, it, is is there greater pressure for international? Is it uh, for practitioners? The question. Actually, e everyone, anyone okay. would know. I don't see it in companies that I work with. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, it's not only because not not because of the pandemic, but because of. Uh, immigration policies that current administration has imposed. Uh, and now I think the mood will change. Uh, and, uh, you know, related to both uh, work, work visas and uh, international student 
uh, international student visas as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, another question at the risk of uh, putting uh, Bob on the spot. Uh, uh, it's basically, uh, are the executives, is there a correlation between the level of bonuses that they, they receive and their success in achieving these uh, goals of uh, increased diversity and inclusion? Absolutely. A absolutely. Um, the, the, the formula for determining bonuses has a component that is directly tied to um, diversity activities within our organizations. We have to flow that down and we have to monitor it and we have to measure it and absolutely uh, is a, a component of the, uh, the bonus formula, if you will. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, and, and, and um, we have to meet you know, certain, certain um, hiring objectives as well um, of underrepresented people. We have to engage in, in um, so many activities over the course of the year to mentor uh, folks. Um, we have to participate in these employee resource groups. It's, it's a very serious thing and it is measured and it, it does factor into the calculation for our compensation. Okay. Uh, there's one comment about that's kind of interesting, um, uh, like how can we as academics and even within training uh, efforts within your companies, not only as I uh, mentioned earlier about building a desire for international experience and develop a global mindset, but uh, to go abroad, you also need to have skills that are in demand uh, and often the STEM related uh, skills are, are so scarce. Um, uh, what, how can we do a better job in, uh, in developing these, uh, a desire for uh, the, uh, traditionally uh, less represented populations to develop these STEM skills. I know I have some colleagues who are very active in uh, STEM uh, skill development for women and uh, so forth. But uh, before people go abroad, they need to have the, uh, the marketable skills that are often um, uh, in, in, that are very scarce. The, and so focus on that in addition to perhaps a a kind of an international perspective would be important. Start early, start early and do it often. Uh, for example, at our university and undergraduate level, um, international mindset and related issues, uh, uh, you know, became part of, of this core 21, as they call them, uh, courses. And, you know, throughout the entire curriculum that they go through, now they're exposed to different um, international issues, uh, both on, you know, in, in, even in, um, in their STEM uh, subjects, you know, like biology, for example, or genetics. And uh, they're encouraged, highly encouraged to go abroad for at least a semester. Mm -hmm. So you need to just to be patient, but do it diligently, you know. I don't want to be politically incorrect, but I will be. Uh, you know, just like a Chinese torture, just drop, <laughs> drop, drop by drop, you know, and this will penetrate, this will work, hopefully. Let me add another, uh, I think it's a great idea, uh, Thomas Bielek uh, mentioned that uh, in his company, have been able to develop the first generation immigrant talent at my organization, it's making it part of their job to interact with the Asian suppliers daily. Uh, so drive down to lower levels within the company opportunities for international connections. I think that is a, uh, is a huge step. Uh, the virtual uh, team uh, kinds of activities. Uh, yeah, and that, I think that's what I was trying to um, say earlier. You know, look where people's talents are. You know, look where they can add value, no matter who they are. Just find what it is that they can add value. And then let them shine. <laughs> yeah, and that's a perfect example of that. Yeah, great. Um, any other, uh, other comments? We're, we're, we have uh, about five minutes left. Sherry, were you about to say it? I was just looking at the uh, one of the questions. I don't know that we addressed. Uh, yeah, 
From a management perspective, many organizations have in place a leadership development and evaluation pipeline from the lowest supervisory level all the way up to the C-suite where management commits a certain amount of the training budget for each level, particularly for women and minorities. And the question is, would you view this as a hybrid model of the exclusive and inclusive practices? And I think the answer to that, Vlad, if I understand your approach is yes, right? Yes, absolutely. It, it's a hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. in, instead of saying exclusive, if you said singularity, you have a singularity focus on you know, uplifting uh, women and minorities who may not have had the same access to the opportunities and training, and, et cetera, and development that their other counterparts may have had. So yes, I think it's a combination of those two things because you're being inclusive with exploring a new talent group, but then you're also uh, focusing on a specific uh, area, uh, you know, talent area. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you have multiple uh, these two talent pools or two yeah. different programs in place, and that's what uh, quite a few large organizations do uh, when they can afford it. And again, I, I, I would like to finish this particular question from my part at least, and uh, also. Uh, following up at what, what Elaine said before, that the cost perspective is important uh, for uh, organizations, of course, because this is the first thing they see and this is the first thing their CFO sees and CEO and shareholders. Uh, but little by little, uh, we need to move from the cost perspective to perhaps supply perspective because supply is dwindling, supply of talent, uh, especially in, uh, uh, developed, in a developed country in the developed world uh, I should say and we need to be really mindful of uh, the supply demand relationship here. That's a really good point Vlad. I am hearing that from most of our especially our tech corporate partners. Uh, some of our technology companies there say they're already telling us we're going to have to import talent. We don't have enough here in the United States to support the work that we have to get done and we're going to have to import talent. Now, making you know, it more remote accessible, I think will be enabling for them to import talent, if you will. But, uh, but to Elaine's point, some of that will require uh, some new looks at our immigration policies so that we can be sure that we're still supporting you know, our competitiveness in the world market by being able to have access to that talent. Agreed, 100%. Thank you very much. Uh, I saw one more uh, hand raised. Um, uh, Francisco Valle, um, perhaps uh, could follow up with a, an email. I was just going to say that uh, I would be very happy to, uh, as long as uh, Sherry and Bob and Elaine and Vlad agree, to uh, share an email if you have a follow-up question for them specifically to uh, communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to uh, continue and keep our, our, uh, the conversation and, and, and continue this, this progress of in increased inclusiveness uh, and for the, the benefit, the competitive benefit for uh, our American corporations. Uh, Dr. Peck now has a survey he wants to to share with the participants. So let me turn the time over to him. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Before we wrap up this webinar, I just wanna share the findings in a recent report released by Oxford Economics. They identify the four areas of employee skill sets that companies expect from their employees. Number one, digital skills and agile thinking skills, communication skills, and global operational skills. And the uh, panelists that uh, actually talk most of these, but uh, the elements today. And I also, as Sherry mentioned that, uh, um, you know, many of the industrialized or developed countries that uh, they need to import talent. So according to the one the other study, um, they compare and contrast that the, uh, the, the talent pool in terms of the, the growth rate between the emerging seven economies versus what the G7 economies. And um, definitely that the G7 economies, they, they, they're, they're going to produce more talent. 
they're going to have more surplus. And uh, in, in stark contrast, that the G7 countries that they will have a very the limited uh, number of talent pool that will continue to produce in the future. So there was no doubt in my mind that uh, you know many of these developed countries, if they want to continue to grow, they have no option but to import this talent. That kind of leads to the what the, why we have to open the door, right? And Elaine particularly mentioned about this, but uh, the immigration policy and, and issues. So in that sense, I think that um, um, there was a, some homework left for us, and particularly that the, the incoming U.S. that um, you know administration. Um, so that's just my final thought. So Dr. Vance, Charlie, thank you so much for moderating such an interesting and intriguing panel discussion. Elaine, Vlad, Sherry, and Bob for sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and important topic today. Above all, I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in spring 2021. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Before you leave, I would really appreciate if you can complete the short survey at the end of this conference. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.